give you a very warm welcome to our service this morning. It's good to see you guys gathered out on such a lovely day as well. What a, what a beautiful morning it is. And I want to begin this morning uh, by reading a psalm which reflects on God's majesty and his, his power, really, that he has displayed, how he's displayed that power even towards his people. In Psalm 135, Psalm 135, verses 1 to 5. This is a psalm that that calls his people to worship. And Psalm 135 says, Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great and that our Lord is above all gods. You know, it's a a good thing for us to stop and give thanks to God, to remember his goodness. uh, And because he, like Israel, he's chosen us as well and he is good and he is great above all others. The peoples, at, at this time this psalm was written, may have reflected on the idols that were around in the land. And yet the psalmist could declare with confidence that there is only one God and he rules above all others. He truly is great and he is good. And so we sing our first hymn, which sings praise to Jesus, our great redeemer, our master, and all that he means to us. This is over a thousand tongues to sing. Let's stand as we sing this together, please.
well, that's one of those hymns you can always tell when someone was a former member of a choir because sometimes you hear all the different you know, bits for people to know where to come in and the, and the little end of the line. But uh, tremendous words, a hymn which invites us to praise our God. He is our Lord, he is our Master and our Redeemer. And so let's come before the Lord together and continue our worship as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, that you have sent a great Redeemer, that he is your Son and our King, our Master. And his name is one who brings great comfort even to the troubled soul, the one who offers hope to the sinner, the promise of cleansing and forgiveness to those who would repent. And so, Lord, we do give you all glory, praise, and honor. Lord, we want to give you thanks, Lord, even for Assembly Sunday last week and uh, for the time even that uh, Jonathan had when he was ministering here and for the church at Donica Dee. Lord, bless them and encourage them. Guide them, Lord, too, as they seek to, to reach out to their community as well as we do and as they try and also reach young families. And we pray also that like our, ourselves, Lord, they would be able to, to start a, a summer club and that it will be well attended. Lord, help them even in their preparations as we even are working in our preparations as well too. Lord, bless them even with fruit for their labor. And Lord, we do ask even for your, your blessing upon us. Lord, we pray for those who are unable to, to be here today due to illness or other circumstance. We continue to pray for Norman in hospital. And Lord, continue to help and strengthen him. And ask, we ask for even strength for Hazel too as she goes up to visit with him. And Lord, we ask also for help for all those who are um, housebound or in nursing homes even at the moment. Lord, just draw near to them. Bless them. Encourage them, Lord, even as they read your word, as they're visited and as they maybe even listen to CDs or watch the, the, the service online as well too. May they be a source of help to them in their walk with you. And Lord, we ask for help for ourselves also as we seek to worship you today. Lord, be glorified in our service as we sing these hymns together. Lord, help us to just to, to focus our thoughts upon you. Lord, remove any distracting thought, Lord. And just as we focus around your word later, just help us as we seek to do that and to proclaim you as the mighty God, the one who is above all things. Lord, you are the only God. And Lord, there are many idols even in this world. And Father, uh, amidst even this world which idolizes so many things, Lord, we pray that people may be able to see even in our lives that we worship and serve the one true God. Father, help our lives to give glory to you. And may our service even do that today. In Jesus' name, amen. But we're going to sing another hymn together and then we'll have some announcements and we'll read God's word just after that. But uh, let's sing this uh, chorus. And again, it's, it's a chorus. It's this chorus, Jesus All for Jesus. It's one that's easy to sing. The tune's simple. Um, but the words are very demanding. You know, because they demand, are we willing to surrender our all to the Lord? Just stay seated as we sing this together. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be.
let me draw your attention to some announcements. You've already seen the announcements up in, in PowerPoint, just some of the regular ones, but so as well as the regular meetings uh, advertised. And tonight, obviously, we're back here at 6.30, and we'll be finishing our series in Matthew's Gospel, or rather, I should say, we're hitting the pause button on it, and because uh, we're reaching another end of one section in Matthew's Gospel, so we're coming to the end of that just tonight. And then on Tuesday at 8 o'clock, um, in our five things to, to pray for the church series, our, 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 our midweek uh, Bible prayer and Bible study. We're going to be praying about the section about children and and also families and the importance of that as well. And we'll be uh, praying about that and for even uh, the witness that each of us have, even in terms of our own families to our children as well. And we do have a great burden for young families in this area. So that's going to be our focus uh, on our prayer meeting on a Tuesday evening. And then I want to give you some advance notice, and I believe Alfie mentioned this last week. Uh, we're going to have a friends and family night with John Cunningham, where John's coming along to share his testimony of how he came to faith in Christ. And um, since it'll be the, the last one of the, the month when that's taking place, there'll be a cup of tea after the service then. So that's on the 29th of May. So can I encourage you from now to then to have a think about who you could invite along to that service. Um, think are there any members of your your family who could come along maybe even there's a a neighbor uh, as well too you could could invite to that can i encourage you to to think and to pray about that and to pray even for them that they they would come along to that so that's on uh the last sunday night in may so with john cunningham and another thing uh we want to maybe try and start uh door to door given the fact that the better weather's coming in the brighter nights so if that's something you'd be interested in helping with please uh, just uh, mention to me at the door and uh some other good news as well regarding evangelism too. Um, I know there's been a few ideas about evangelistic events. Uh, we've just received word just a few weeks ago that actually we're going to be getting a college team this year. So uh, the college is going to be sending us a team. Now that's not until October time. Now you may be thinking hey, that's quite far away. But believe you me, when it comes to organizing for this week, we're going to need all that time to try and prepare for it. Because usually what happens when an evangelism team comes to a church, uh, the college will send, um, I think, we've, uh, well, we don't know exactly how many we'll be getting um, in October, but they're there to help us in whatever way we can put them to use. So sometimes that could be going into the schools. Uh, it can be doing door-to-door work. And uh, in other ways, we can run evangelistic events in the church, which is certainly we certainly hope to do. So we're going to be looking towards that and planning towards that as well. We appreciate your prayers for that. Um, but we will run other evangelistic events leading up to that. I don't want you to be thinking we're going to wait and wait to October to evangelize. Not at all. Uh, we're starting with, the, hopefully, uh, God willing, with Door to Door, and then these family and friends nights as well too. But uh, we are going to try and organize that uh, week in October as a special you know, focus for that week of several evangelistic events. So it's great that the college have agreed to send us a team to help with that. And we're very much looking forward to that. Um, The other thing as well is uh, I do hope you've enjoyed the assembly meetings last week. And if you did miss them, um, you can watch them all online. Now, because they're in all different places, uh, there are in all different places online as well, too, to get them. So, for example, the Baptist Missions Night is on the Irish Baptist Missions YouTube channel. Uh, I think for the Women's Night, you need to go to uh, Windsor Baptist uh, YouTube, and you can actually watch the Women's Night again. And then the college one is on the college YouTube page. So uh, you can watch all those services online. And if you did miss them, can I encourage you to, to have a look at those? Because they were very, very encouraging. And we will be praying some about some of those needs that, that came up. And during those evenings, we'll be praying for them a little bit later in the service. And two other things. Um, the Acre magazine is out as well, just at the back. As is the new UCB notes as well too. And I think these are all the announcements. It's quite a lot of announcements today, but I think that's, that's them all. Uh, we're we're going to turn at this point to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 12. And as I mentioned a few weeks ago... We've nearly finished our series in the book of Nehemiah. We've only got this chapter and one other to go. And the last time we were here, uh, last week, of course, there was a break for Assembly Sunday uh, as Jonathan Burke was was here uh, for, and I was at Donica D uh, preaching there. And at the last time then we were in the book of Nehemiah, we had one of these infamous list passages in Nehemiah 11. And there are several lists, and you come across another one in Nehemiah chapter 12. And maybe when you see all these lists in Nehemiah, you might be saying to yourself, 
Nehemiah, why did you, you put all these lists in your, in your book? You know, maybe, um, you know, why, why did you record all these? Why not record just some other action events that occurred? But actually, these lists are important as well, too. And today we come across another list. And again, we're going to consider a little bit later why Nehemiah might have recorded that information. But we're going to consider actually today what happened next. Um, So I want to look at verse 27, beginning to look at verse 27 of Nehemiah chapter 12. And in case you think, Neil, you've just escaped those list of names, as you'll read down this passage, you'll see. No, I haven't, because there's a few more of them here. And if anyone had wanted to volunteer for the reading today, I would have happily have let them. But Nehemiah chapter 12 and verse 27, and let's read this. Well, we'll be referring to the earlier verses as well. And God's word says, At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness. This was the dedication of the walls. With thanksgiving uh, and with thanksgivings and with singing, with cymbals, harps, and lyres. And the, the son, sons of the singers gathered together from the districts surrounding Jerusalem and from the villages of the Netophites, and from Beth Gilgal, and from the region of Geba and Asmavath. For the singers had built for themselves villages around Jerusalem. And the priests and the Levites purified themselves, and they purified the people and the gates and the wall. Then I brought up the leaders of Judah up onto the wall and appointed two great choirs that gave thanks. One went to the south on the wall to the dung gate, and after them went Hoshiah and half of the leaders of Judah, and Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, and Jeremiah, and certain of the priest's sons with trumpets. Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, son of Shemaiah, son of Mataniah, son of Micaiah, son of Zachar, son of Asaph, and his relatives, Shemaiah, Azarel, Meliah, Galiah, Maiah, Nathanael, Judah, Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. And Ezra the scribe went up before them. At the fountain gate they went up straight before them by the stairs of the city of David, at the ascent of the wall above the house of David to the water gate on the east. The other choir of those who gave thanks went to the north, and I followed them with half of the people on the wall, above the tower of the ovens, to the broad wall, and above the gate of Ephraim, and by the gate of Yeshaniah, and by the fish gate and the tower of Haniel, and the tower of the hundred to the sheep gate. And they came to a halt at the gate of the guard. So both choirs of those who give thanks stood in the house of God, and I and half of the officials with me, and the priests Eliakim, Masaiah and Maniam, Micaiah, Elioniah, Zechariah and Hananiah with trumpets, and Masaiah, Shemaiah, Eliezer, Uzi and Jehonan, oh, this one got me stuck now, Malchahijah, uh, Elam and Ezer, and the singers sang with Jezariah as their leader, and they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. On that day, men were appointed over the storerooms, the contributions, the first fruits and the tithes, to gather into them the portions required by the law for the priests and for the Levites, according to the fields of the towns. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and the Levites who ministered, and they performed the service of their God and the service of purification as did the singers and the gatekeepers, according to the command of David and his son Solomon. For long ago, in the days of David and Asaph, there were directors of the singers, and there were songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. And all Israel in the days of Zerubbabel and the days of Nehemiah gave the daily portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, and they set apart that which was for the Levites. And the Levites set apart that which was for the sons of Aaron. And this is the word of God. Well, before we turn to the scriptures once again, let's sing another hymn together. And this this passage has reminded us even about the importance of of purity. And so indeed does our next hymn, Take Time to Be Holy. And it reminds us even of the role that the word of God plays. And, And the Holy Spirit, as he impresses that word upon our hearts, plays in that process of our sanctification. So, Uh, If you're able to, let's uh, stand as we sing this together. Take time to be holy.
Well, before we turn to God's Word once again, let's remember in prayer some of those uh, even needs that were presented during those assembly meetings as well too. We're going to pray for uh, John Brew as he settles back in Peru. And if you uh, are on Facebook or you may have seen some of the photos actually because uh, Mervyn accompanied them on part of the journey back to Peru. I think he was accompanying them on the plane to uh, to Amsterdam and then they were, that's where they were, were parting company and then they were going to, on to Peru. So they've actually made it back to Peru and uh, they had a little welcome uh, celebration for, for John there as he arrived. So as you'll know, John has been back, was back here for, for two years. He thought he was only coming on furlough for a short time and actually he ended up because of the pandemic being all that time over here. And he's been very eager, as we know, when we had him along to uh, our midweek. He was very eager to get back to Peru to teach and back in the seminary at Tacna. So uh, John will be uh, teaching there again as he settles back in. But just pray for them as they do settle back into their home. He was even just talking in the assembly meetings about all just the, even the practical arrangements that need to happen as a result of them settling back in. They're going to have to, I think, fumigate the house because it's been left for two years in that hot and humid climate as well. So just pray for them as they just even get back into things um, in Peru. Um, we're going to remember also Letitia Anstead and her team. And there's many other different Baptist missions needs. I can't mention all of them, uh, but we will do that obviously over uh, the weeks and so on as well. Uh, we're praying for the new uh, students as well too, that there will be new students in the college and for those who have graduated. And I believe you had uh, one along last Sunday night, Richard Donnan, and he's going to be the new pastor in Newton Arch Baptist. Um, Richard was actually there in Donica D when I was preaching last Sunday morning. Um, so it was a surprise for me whenever we arrived at the same time. I thought the double booked us or something initially, but uh, no, he was just along to hear the, the service. And Donica D is visiting a few different places before he starts. Uh, Newton Orange at the end of May. So pray for him even in his preparations for that and pray for him and his family. So let's pray together and remember all these different prayer needs. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, even for the encouragements of the assembly meetings. We do pray for the work of Baptist missions. We pray for Mervyn as he coordinates that work. Lord, we want to give thanks for the abilities and the talents you've given him. And Father, just help him, um, even as he just seeks to, to care for our, uh, our missions workers as, as best he can. But not only that, as he seeks to look also for new opportunities. And we do want to give thanks, Lord, even for the uh, new laborers who are being raised up as well. And as he, Mervyn looks even for many more, Lord, just help us as we do seek to pray that you will send more laborers right into the harvest. Father, we do pray for Letitia Anstead and her team as uh, she seeks to reach out to the students in France. And hi, Lord, as we heard something of that work uh, last Tuesday evening, Lord, just encourage her and her team with that. And we want to give thanks for those who have been, been gathering in in those meetings and for those they have been able to share the gospel with. We want to give thanks for John and Lourdes as they settle back into Peru and as John would uh, teach again in the seminary. Lord, we want to give thanks for a safe arrival and just help them as even as they do settle back in and even just in the practical arrangements as they settle back into their home again after all these years. Lord, just help them even in what they need to do, even in that regard. And Father, we are mindful also of the, our, our college and the students there. We want to give thanks for those who have graduated and how you've proved your faithfulness even in their lives just as they've undertaken that period of study. And Lord, just for those who are moving into new roles, those even have been taken on in the ministry partnership scheme, Lord, we do pray for them. We pray as they will prepare for and as they uh, just will be starting even in a few weeks or months' time, Lord, just help them. Father, we pray for Richard as he starts in a new Nard shortly, even as he thinks and just in what to preach on and just in many different arrangements that need to be made. Lord, just lead and guide him. May know of your help. And Father, we want to also thank you for the work of Baptist women. We give thanks, Lord, even for the help and encouragement, even that these courses that have been running uh, over these last number of years has been such a help to many women in our churches. And Father, we want to give thanks for the Baptist Women event and that was run on the, the Friday night, Lord, and just for, for all those who came down that evening that they were encouraged by um, the reminder from Psalm 46. 
Lord, that you are our refuge and strength. And Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, for our fellowship of churches. And we do pray for Dave Ramsey, as once again he coordinates that work. Father, just may you know your help and blessing and your guidance. And we pray for Mark Patterson, our new uh, president, Lord. Just be with him as he travels around various churches. Father, just keep him safe in that travel. May he be encouraged even by that. And may churches be encouraged by his ministry as well too. And so, Father, just we pray also for ourselves now as we come around your word. As we come to a, a passage which uh, maybe sometimes at first glance maybe even seems to be hard to, to understand even what's going on here. But just help us to understand and prepare our hearts to receive your word. And Father, through your spirit, apply this word to our lives. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's turn to Nehemiah chapter 12 once more. And in, in the second half of Nehemiah 12, the passage we've read here, it, there, you find a great celebration. And God's people had plenty to celebrate, you see, because there was the rebuilding of the wall, and we, we heard about that many chapters ago. Uh, but there was a restoration of worship even before that. And all of this, though, remember the great significance of what was going on here. Here was the fulfillment of, of a long time, not just a period of a number of weeks and months. This was the fulfillment of years of work. Turning our Bibles with me to the book of Ezra once more, let's remind ourselves about this. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Let's remind ourselves where this kind of began. And we looked at this in January 2021, the book of Ezra. And let me just read these first four verses. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Ezra 1 verse 2, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, and besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So this in many ways was the beginning here in Ezra of the return. Cyrus's decree. And you'll notice again in this that this was so that the word of the Lord would be fulfilled. That word was given by Jeremiah long ago. Here was a movement of God. And even Cyrus saw this in verse 2. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me the kingdoms of the earth. Cyrus recognized this. And he's charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem. Here was the Lord moving in this king's heart to be able to grant a Persian king nonetheless too. The Lord was moving in this man's heart to be able to cause his people to return. And God was working a powerful miracle. Because God's people, when they were in exile, must have been wondering, however are we going to get back to the land? Jeremiah promised, and people like Isaiah promised, we were going to return back to our own people. And they must have wondered how all that was going to come about. And at the time, they couldn't see it. They couldn't see it. And yet God, in a powerful movement, had moved in someone's heart in a way even that they didn't even know at the time. They couldn't have known what was going on in Cyrus's heart. And yet the Lord was putting it in his heart to cause these people to return. And a remnant had been preserved. God and his goodness had preserved this remnant. And you see what had happened. When, though the Babylonians had taken the people away into exile, the Persians had overcome them. And the Persians were the ones who were in control here. And the Persians were the ones who said, they ran things a little bit differently. Because the Persians wanted to keep peace with the, these people. And so they actually let often the peoples return to their own lands. But I don't want you to think because they were back in Jerusalem that, you know, the Persians had no say over them. No, Cyrus was still in control of these people. Cyrus was the one who still they had to kind of pay taxes to and so on as well. But in God's goodness, he preserved a remnant. He put it in Cyrus's heart to let these people return. And these events happened many years before. What an amazing way 
God move. Turn back to, to Nehemiah chapter 12. And this passage is really reflecting on that goodness. Because here was the culmination of it all. Here was, the, by this stage, the temple had been rebuilt. Now again, that didn't happen overnight. It actually, that, what, that first return, really it was a period of about 100 years. So from Ezra 1 that we've just read to this passage in Nehemiah 12, about 100 years has happened. Now, this teaches us some important lessons. Firstly, it shows us that God's purposes will be accomplished in God's time and in his way. So what lessons can we take of this? Firstly, God's purposes will be accomplished in his time and in his way. And that's the thing. A return, you see, was led by Zerubbabel at the start. And then... The event here down to the time of Nehemiah. Zerubbabel led that first return given by Cyrus, let the people go. And there was other returns happened between then as well. But, you know, God's timing, we sometimes struggle with God's timing, don't we? Because we, we pray maybe about things and, you know, we, we want answers. We want answers basically yesterday. We want answers quickly when we pray about things. You know, we live in, a, a, in an age where it's, it's in many ways an instant society. Uh, you can have you have fast food. You have uh, fast food, instant coffee. We don't like to be kept waiting, uh, whether that be on a phone or whether that be in a, in a queue, in a shop. We don't like waiting, do we? But yet sometimes that waiting is necessary even to prepare people's hearts as well. And also, God teaches many lessons during the time, even of the waiting as well. God taught the people lessons. You know, there were, there were times where they faced opposition. There were difficult times during those 100 years. It wasn't just all smooth sailing. Remember, when they first started to rebuild that temple, they, didn't, they actually grinded to a halt when they built the foundations of it. And things were left for years. And then the Lord put it in the prophets' hearts, other prophets to come along, people like Zechariah to, to come along, and Haggai to encourage the people to build again, to build that temple. So the Lord moved. The Lord moved in people's hearts. And you know, sometimes we don't always observe that. The we, when we, from our perspective, sometimes it looks to us as if nothing is happening, when in actual fact, things were happening. God worked in Cyrus's heart when all those people were praying, Lord, bring us back to the land. And they were wondering, however, is that going to happen? God was moving in a king's heart and they didn't even know it. You know, maybe you've had an experience maybe of, of chatting with someone about or sharing your faith with someone and you haven't known it, but the Lord has, has you in that place and that time. I remember an experience when, uh, when we went round uh, door to door in, in Shankill one time and there was a woman who'd, um, was actually she was uh, she had just been I mean, given news from the hospital, and she was actually quite concerned about that news. And apparently that day she was this woman was a believer. She had been praying that day, Lord, send someone to encourage me, send someone to encourage me. And there at two o'clock or half two, whatever it was in the afternoon, there was us rapping on her door, and she ended up she brought three of us in, all three of us into her house, and we were encouraging that woman. And that was an instance of the way he was being prepared. I've seen other instances like that where maybe we've tried to witness to someone and some has got, some, the Lord has brought maybe even some circumstance into our life and he's been preparing their heart even for you witnessing to them as well. But you know, that work, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. We sometimes do struggle with the timing of God because God does move in his time and his way. And just thinking back to missions night, you know, maybe as you've seen uh, the video of um, John and Lord's Brew of all the, the, the people whose lives they touched. And just as you see those who were saved, other churches who were raised up, don't forget that that didn't happen overnight. I think, wasn't it 90 years? Uh, I think it was over a period of 90 years that work's been established. The Lord has moved over that time. The progress was slow. The progress was gradual. I'm sure there was times where they wondered, is anything happening here? But yet God did work. The Lord moved, obviously, uh, before even John and so on was there. There was others who were carrying on the work, as John shared before that. 
But even just that lesson was brought across to me on, on Tuesday evening as I heard even Letitia Anstead and her team talk about, you know, she was talking about how the task was so great as they're reaching out to, to students in France and they're reaching out, it's a vast number of international students they're reaching out to as well. And they've only such a small team. But yet she was talking how it's a small team, but yet God is moving. Even they've been able to meet and have fellowship dinners with, with, with people even as well and just try and share their faith in that way. They've, they're given out lots and lots of booklets and leaflets and, and often they don't see maybe the fruit of that labor. But God uses that. You think about even the leaflets we've distributed even already. Uh, there was um, last, uh, last year in July, for example, we distributed those magazines. We don't often know what has become of those people who we spoke to. Or he'd received those magazines. I did have a, um, an incident a number of years ago, I remember, that really brought this lesson home to me. I was actually um, attending a, um, a funeral service at another church. And uh, when I was at that funeral service, uh, it was the, the minister actually spoke to me after. And he said how he'd been visiting uh, a, a woman uh, recently. And he says this woman became a Christian a number of years ago. Now, We didn't know, our church didn't know anything about this, but this woman had come to one of the missions that we held that year. It was two years before. And we'd been praying and praying, Lord, save someone. And we'd been earnestly praying. And I think people were were sure that, you know, the Lord, we're going to see someone saved here. Because, you know, just that we felt even the spirit in the meetings as well. And we didn't hear of anything after. And two years later, I was at this funeral service and the man was saying, I've just met someone recently. And it turns out they were saved at a mission that was being run in their church. And actually, do you know what? They didn't actually speak to even anyone at the mission. They just seen this. We were actually running like a tent mission at the time. They came into the tent, sat through the meeting, were convicted and took a little booklet home. But they read that booklet and they trusted the Lord that very same night. We didn't know anything about that. That was two years before. We were downhearted about that. We thought there's been nothing happened here. And there was the Lord moving. So that's why whenever we even are engaged in any evangelistic effort, we have to play our part and to to share the gospel. And whether that's handing out a leaflet in the door, whether that's sharing your testimony with someone, you know, we do get downhearted, don't we, when we don't say anything. And it's right for us to have that, that hunger and desire to see souls saved. But also don't underestimate God's power to move. Because he does move. And people's lives. He is moving. And even that work that you've done for the Lord. God can use that. God will use that as well. See God's work moves in his way. And and something else as well too. That work takes time. The work isn't always glamorous. Or exciting. It often takes place in many ways. That are unnoticed. You know maybe it might be individuals. Even reaching out as well too. And here, don't forget, when you have this celebration scene here, don't forget it wasn't just those up at the front who were involved in this work. It was all the people. The people had come together. And remember one of those big lists. Again, there's an example where the lists are in there for a reason. There was a list of ordinary people who were working in rebuilding of the walls. There was one man, um, he he and his daughters were working on the walls. There was others who were goldsmiths, people who knew, knew nothing about building, but yet they too played their part. You know, what an important lesson that is for us. You know, we need to, to keep on, to keep on trusting, to keep on serving, to not give up. And the fact that the first part of Nehemiah 12 makes this connection for us. Have a look at the first few verses of this chapter. We didn't read this, and again, there's another list. But again, that list is there for a very good reason. And these lists aren't just put in just for fun, you know. They're, they're put in uh, there for, I mean, this may have been in, uh, part of Nehemiah's record and kept for, actually, so the king, even the king maybe would have seen records like this. But verse 1 in Nehemiah 12 is a list of priests and Levites who first came up with Zerubbabel. And here, this is talking about the first return. So Nehemiah is looking back. They look back at the very beginning of this chapter. And verse 1 to 7, there's a list of family names. So here's those who returned previously. And then verses 8 to 21 is the list of the Levites. 
So there's the priests and then the Levites. But something that may not be obvious to us as we glance down this list is that the list uh, in verses 10 to 11 actually spans more than 100 years. When you dig into these names and actually find out who are these people, this is actually a period of about 100 years. So here's why Nehemiah is making this connection here. He's making a connection between the movement of God in the past, the first return of the exiles, and what was going on now. And what Nehemiah is saying is that this is part of the same movement of God. God moved. He's looking back to the past. And it's good for us to look back to the past and be thankful for it. But we can't also live in the past. We must also engage with what's going on as well today. We learn even from the lessons of the past, don't we, as well? And as he looked back in the past, he saw how God was faithful. And so he continues to see that God's still faithful today. God hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. Our world is changing all the time, isn't it? But none of that surprises God. God knows all things, but God is still faithful. And Nehemiah is making this connection by what was going on, that present work, that present celebration, by giving this list of names right from the first return, right up to now. He's making that connection. God moved in his time and in his way. And in other words, he's saying, we're here today because of what God has even done in the past. And they couldn't have imagined even the ways in which God had moved They didn't know it would take several returns. They wouldn't have known there'd be discouragements, there'd be setbacks, there'd be oppositions. But through it all, God kept that remnant. God kept his people. He preserved them. Now, if that's not encouraging today, I don't know what is. God keeps his people. God is faithful. God has not changed. And what it requires from us still is that continual commitment and faithfulness the serving, to keep trusting, to keep praying. And rather than what we think isn't happening, we have to believe in what God is doing. It doesn't mean simply we just sit back. No, not at all. That's not what I'm saying. But we keep trusting that God is moving in people's hearts and lives. And we pray, and we pray that God, we would see fruit for that labor. But here also now we come to a new section in verse 27, this celebration and dedication. And over the last few chapters of Nehemiah, as Ezra and the Levites had begun to read the word of God to the people, they'd seen, they'd been looking back to the past. They'd seen the history of their people, even the sin of their people. They'd seen God's grace and how uh, they had been brought home to them. And they'd made that public commitment and signing even the covenant to say, yes, we will serve the Lord. Yes, we will trust the Lord. And now what they're going to do here in verses 27 to 30 is dedicate what they've done to the Lord. And verse 27 to 30 shows us the preparations they made. And it's, it's similar in the, um, in the preparations even that they made when they dedicated the temple after they rebuilt. So they summoned the Levites from the villages. So the Levites and the worship leaders, uh, and they gather together. So you have the singers, the musicians, all getting ready to worship. And uh, in First Corinthians, First Chronicles sorry, 24, David organized the priests, you see, into 24 divisions. So there were, there were two divisions, you see, of priests for, for each month of the year. So they would take it in turns to serve in the temple. So 24 divisions in total, and then um, two divisions of priests for each month. So one priest then would be in duty for, for two weeks uh, of the year, and then the rest of the time the priest would go about their, their, their daily life as well. There would be others who would serve in the temple, but that's what would happen. So there would be a list of some who would serve. There were a number of priests, obviously, who would serve in the temple. Um, but, you know, they, they, these priests would serve. They wouldn't be serving there all the time. There would be rotas of when these would serve. And so the rest of the time they went back to their villages. And that's why they're saying, now let's get them all together. Let's get all of these people together and let's serve the Lord. And notice what they did. Not only did they gather the people, verse 30, they prepared themselves to worship the Lord. The Levites purified not only themselves, but they purified the people and the gates and the wall. Now, Nehemiah doesn't tell us exactly what this purification ritual included. But under the old covenant, they purified themselves by, by washing themselves and their clothes. Or they put on clean clothes and they, they fasted as well. They sometimes even sprinkled themselves on objects with water. And they did this before bringing their, their offerings. You see, the thing is, the people needed cleansing. 
And of course, all people need cleansing. And so too, if, if sinners want to come before a holy God, sinners need to have their hearts cleansed. And God provided that cleansing through giving of his son, through his sacrifice upon the cross. When he paid the debt for our sin, and through faith in him we are cleansed by God's grace. But for the Christian, I want you to notice that holiness is important. That's what this passage shows us. The importance even of purification and holiness. And though we are under the the new covenant, we aren't bound by those old covenant um, sacrifices and cleansing rituals, but we as God's people are called to be pure as well. And we are to have clean hearts. We are to have right attitudes and motives even as we come to God, right motives. See, our worship isn't going to be accepted by God if we aren't fitting instruments for his service. I'd said about this before, you wouldn't dream of going somewhere for dinner and seeing dirty cutlery in front of you. You wouldn't go, oh, okay, and just go on with it. Normally, if you've seen, say, like someone's you know, cutlery sitting that's been used from the, a previous uh, diner being in, you'd be saying, you know, excuse me, can I have a clean knife and fork, please? You'd be asking for that. But so, if we have to be fitting instruments for God's service too, Romans 12 verse 1, to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable to God, which is our spiritual worship. Or what about 1 Peter 15 to 16? But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And here's the thing, if if we regard sin in our hearts, If there's unconfessed sin in our hearts, it hinders our worship. It hinders even our service. It hinders even our prayers being answered. Psalm 66, verse 18. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Unconfessed sin even hinders blessing in our Christian life. Proverbs 28, verse 13. Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find mercy. You see, it's important that nothing in our hearts hinders our worship. And this was the same thing in this passage. They wanted to cleanse themselves before coming to worship. They wanted this, uh, what they had done to be, to be used by God. But they had to have their hearts right as well too. You know, it's important that there be nothing that hinder our hearts, or that would hinder our worship, That's why Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount spoke about if we offer a gift at the altar while having a disagreement with another brother, we should leave the place of worship and be reconciled with your brother first, even before bringing that gift. It was essential that this worship and dedication you see be God-glorifying, that it would be offered with, with true hearts. And wasn't that what Jesus confronted the religious leaders about? That worship isn't just about the externals. It's not just about coming here singing and, and, and praying and, and reading God's word and studying it. It's, it's about how is our heart? How is our heart? You know, we maybe get ready for, when we get ready for church in the morning, uh, you, you know, maybe you, you comb your hair, you, you, you maybe put on the clothes you've left out uh, for, for church that day. You prepare yourself. But do we give thought about preparing our hearts? What about our own hearts? You know, I don't know what kind of week you had uh, the previous week. Maybe it has been a difficult week for you. And maybe you do need that time sometimes just to be still, to be quiet before the Lord, to even confess the sin that's in our hearts, and to actually prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. You know, these people were prepared to worship And notice they they were gathered together. In verse 31, Nehemiah brings the leaders of the people up onto the wall. And he appoints two choirs. Now, what they do from verse 32 to 43 is that the two choirs go round the walls. And basically they're going this way. One's going clockwise and one's going anti-clockwise round the walls. Now, I have to say, when you're thinking maybe of the image of the wall, I don't want you getting the image of a little small wall like you have in, the, in your garden. Don't be thinking that we're all balancing along in the wall. You know, it's not like that at all. These walls actually were thought were about nine feet wide. Nine feet wide. This was the, such was the wall that they were building. So the choirs were able actually to go walking alongside it, probably about three abreast even as we're going along that wall. So this procession happens and 
you know, as they were walking along in this, the people were able to see for themselves the work that they had done. You know, imagine if you were part of that choir. Imagine you were part of that singing along. I don't know what song they sang. I'm not sure. Probably not the ones we sung this morning anyway. Uh, but as they were walk, going along that wall, think about it. You would maybe, as you were coming along, would walk to the spot that maybe you'd, this was maybe the spot you'd built. How that would mean something. How you would say, I remember that. Do you remember the, the days we had trying to put that together? Or also, as you were doing that walk, you'd be reminded, we didn't do that alone. You know, we're in this together. We're in this together. How that walking along and just considering God's goodness was a powerful and important reminder. But here, I want you to notice, they knew that they were doing this and what they had done, it was, they weren't just saying how great we are. No, they were praising God. Because they were here, this wall existed, this city existed because of God's goodness and God's grace. And God deserved all the glory. But I want you to notice the other effect of this little procession that went on. Verse 43. You see, this work was actually a witness to others. Remember, their, their, their enemies once mocked them. Wasn't it Tobiah who said, Do you know, look at that wall you're building. Even a fox could knock that down. Well, now they there were walking in this wall that was nine feet thick, and they were thinking to themselves, Tapaya, no fox is going to knock this wall down. You know, here is this, it was just secured, and they could testify to God's goodness. And that was a powerful witness. As they rejoiced in that day, it, it gave them great joy. You know, they, the women and children also rejoiced at this. Maybe, okay, the children maybe weren't up exactly up in the walls. Uh, maybe they were walking alongside as the, the choirs made their way. Maybe the women and children were making a procession themselves on the inside as they're looking up to what was going on on the walls. But the joy of Jerusalem, it says, was heard far away. Do you know, as believers, we're meant to be a joyful people. Now, it doesn't mean that everything in our life is always perfect. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that we won't go through hard times. But we have a deeper joy within our lives that not even the most difficult times can rob us of. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10. People are reminded the joy of the Lord is their strength. And we know that when we go to be with the Lord, that joy will be a feature because in his presence there is fullness of joy. You know, God's people have a deeper joy. Because we know that even though we do go through difficult times, we know God has a purpose in it. We may not always know or understand what that purpose is, but we can be sure that God is in control. We can also be sure that God is also near in that difficult time. God never forsake these people, and he won't forsake us as well. He won't forsake us. We have that deep joy of knowing we have one who is with us. We have one to whom we can pray to. And he can help give us that grace, help, and even in that time of need. What joy that is. To know, and, and nothing or no one can take that away from you. We have joy in knowing that whatever happens to us physically, nothing can even take away that promise of that eternal heavenly home. Nothing can rob us of that. Nothing can snatch us out of God's hand. That's a deep joy. There are many things that give this deep joy and we see it in Scripture. And, and when you read those promises like that, hold on to them. Because you know what? There's going to be a day when you're going to need those. There's going to be a day when you're going to need to remember those very same promises. But you know that joy of the Lord is a powerful witness. You know, did you ever think about how maybe your joy as a witness to others? Can others see the joy of the Lord in your life? Can they see you delighting to, in the fellowship of the Lord and the fellowship with, we have with one another? They, can they see you delighting in the blessings that God has given us? I wonder what kind of advert are we for the life-changing power of the gospel? But I want you to notice also here as we, we draw near to the close, because they weren't just looking back and that's what quite a bit of this passage is about. They're looking forward to. Verses 40, 44 to 47. See, they weren't just celebrating and dedicating, but the second thing was they were commitment. This was commitment to the future. 
Because the same day, as well as this great procession, they appointed people over the storerooms, the contributions, the first fruits, and the tithes. It says these things were required by the law, you see, for the, the priests and the Levites. You see, it's important that this day of celebration wouldn't just happen and fizzle out. It was important that the worship continue. It was important that the Lord's people continue. And um, what we see is these people were thankful for those who God appointed. At the end of verse 44, it says Judah, and that's talking really referring to the people, rejoiced over the priests and Levites who ministered. They were thankful for those who served them. I wonder, are you ever, do you ever stop and be thankful for your office bearers, for the office bearers we have here? I know I am thankful and grateful for them. I am thankful for the role that each of them play. We all need your prayers. But be thankful for them because they do have important roles to play. And it's good that we appreciate them. And the other thing I want you to notice that in their worship, they were not just thankful for those who serve, but they were seeking to worship the law and the Lord in the way he prescribed. They were seeking to worship the Lord in the way he prescribed, verses 45 to 47. And that was not only evidence of their obedience, but it showed faith in God's promises, God's future promises. Because God said, I promise I'll make my name dwell in Jerusalem. God promised that the temple, from the temple in Jerusalem, it says even God's glory will spread over the, to the whole earth. From Jerusalem, there would be a future for Jerusalem. There was going to be a future for it. And that's what these people were even displaying in the evidence of this. The fact that they were committing to say, let's not only give thanks for the past, but let's go on for the future. It showed that they believed there was a future here for these people. Why? Because they believed God's promises. Verse 47, they continued to give daily portions for the singers and Levites, uh, singers and gatekeepers. They set apart what was for the Levites as well too. And you know, that was a sacrifice for God's people. I don't want you thinking that these were people who were, you know, uh, flush with money. No, they weren't. At that time, it was a time of great economic and political crisis. And yet they continued to give sacrificially in order to support God's work. And it reminds us of the, of the importance of the, the temple and the worship of God to their lives. Worship was a priority. Serving God was a priority in their lives. I wonder what priority does the worship of God in our church have in our lives? Is it a priority for us to be here? Or are there other things in our life which sometimes take a higher priority? I wonder what are our own attitudes to church and uh, what uh, to the Lord's people, what that communicates to others in our lives. Do they see us as a community that is loving, a people that love the Lord, a people that love one another, a people that love the lost? Can they see that in our lives? But you know, I am thankful for how, when I've seen people come in, how you have welcomed them as well too. That is very encouraging. You know, because people need to see that, that we are genuine. We are God's people. And we love the Lord, we love one another, and we love the lost. You know, as we close, God's people were looking back and giving thanks. They were also looking forward and seeing the purposes of God, even through Jerusalem. What they knew was God wasn't finished with them yet. That's what they knew. You know, they knew, and ultimately one greater would come. And we'll talk about that around the table. See, there is a sense in Israel's history, and maybe as you came to a passage like this, or maybe as you looked at Nehemiah, you're thinking, what does this possibly have to say to us today? But actually, Israel's history is, is part of our history in many ways too. Because through God's people, we'd come our Redeemer. God is, has a purpose for these people. He's a purpose for us, for our lives too. You know, so let us listen, let us learn. And there are parallels with what's going on today. There's so many parallels. Actually, as I've looked through the book of Nehemiah, I've seen that, and hopefully you can too. But next week, we're not going to come to the conclusion of this series. But what we'll see is it doesn't end in the way you expect. And hopefully that little teaser might make you want to come back for next week to hear actually what happened. But you can actually read ahead if you want and find out. But it doesn't end in the way we expect. But that too has something to say to us. Let's sing together as we come um, around the table.
And we're going to sing just shortly. I'll pray, and then after that, we're going to sing this hymn. And this hymn is one that encourages us. Well, it challenges us about offering up our lives to God. But it also reminds us of Christ's sacrifice as well, too. Let's pray together, and then we'll sing this before we meet around the table. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for the lessons in the book of Nehemiah. That this does have something to say to us. That this is the history of your people. But Father, it shows us of how you move among your people. It shows us that you move in your time and your way. And Father, just challenge us about that as well too. Help us to remember, Lord, that you are moving. That even all these things that are happening in the world around us, Lord, they don't surprise you. They only serve to just advance that timetable of yours. You know, alone know the timetable of when Christ will return. But Father, till then, help us to keep serving. Father, how this teaches us of your faithfulness too. And Father, we've seen that faithfulness in our own lives. And Father, help us to keep trusting in your faithfulness. Father, grant us fruit for your labor. Cause us, Lord, to, to celebrate and give thanks. Father, even as we look back, we do give thanks for the, the past. We do give thanks for the, the members that we have here, and adherents. We give thanks for them. Father, we also look to the future. And as even we're thinking, Lord, even of just even plans for future evangelistic opportunities, Lord, Father, just grant us fruit for that labor. Lord, add families to the church. Save souls. Father, the work that we have done already and to, to your glory, Father, use it for your glory. Use that even to maybe save someone. And Father, help our lives may we dedicate ourselves fully and completely to you, trusting in you, for you are the wonderful God. And as we see of your promises fulfilled around the table, Lord, encourage us with it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this hymn. I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. Just stay seated even as we sing this, please.
Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. And just while you're turning that up, over the last little while, uh, we've heard many people make promises, promises leading up to uh, the election and how even the media is, media is waiting and watching to see whether promises will be kept. But this passage, actually, that we're going to read from, reminds us about promises kept. And actually, the passage we read today was also about promises kept. We've seen promises being fulfilled in Ezra and right through to Nehemiah. A promise that God would prepare a remnant for the people. A promise that he would return them to the land. A promise that Jerusalem would be restored again. And these promises were fulfilled even through that decree of Cyrus. Through the multiple returns of the exiles. And over a period of a hundred years as Jerusalem was being rebuilt. God keeps his promises. Let me read these familiar verses that also remind us of promises kept. Galatians 4 verses 4 to 5. I've mentioned these verses before, but today I want to bring a few other things out of them. So Galatians 4 verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. You know, like the exile, uh, they saw God's promises fulfilled in God's time and his way. But this verse reminds us of how God fulfilled his promises of sending a redeemer. How he would send his Messiah. He came in his time, in the fullness of time, the time set by God the Father. But this verse reminds us that the promised one would be none other than, than God himself. He was the son of God. You know, Isaiah had declared that he would be the mighty God. And he was, he did the, the works of God. Things that only God could do. He had the power to heal. He had the power over creation. The power even to forgive sins. And the Savior came in the way that God promised. He didn't uh, uh, just all of a sudden appear with a, a fanfare and a demand. But he, he was born of a woman. As had been foretold in the promise given to the Adam and Eve long before. He came in humility. Even as Isaiah said. A child was born. A son was given. He also lived as God promised too. He would, uh, was born under the law. He would live, come from among the people of Abraham. The Jews. And he was one through whom even. Remember the promise that was given to Abraham long before. The one through whom all through his line the nations would be blessed. Jesus came from that line. He fulfilled the promise even made to Moses. That how from the one would rise up like Moses among his people. Jesus was the fulfillment of that. He came to accomplish the Father's purpose. And this reminds us of that promise kept too in these verses. Born unto the law, he lived that perfect life so that he could make atonement for our sin. To redeem those under the law so that we could receive adoption as sons. Jesus came to do the will of the one who sent him and he did that will perfectly. He redeemed us through his blood and it's only through him that we can become part of that family of God. You see, in Nehemiah 12, the people could look at Jerusalem. They could look at the temple. They could look at the walls. And those walls were that visible and continual reminder of God's promise kept. You know, we don't look, need to look at buildings really to see evidence of God's promises kept. We can look at our lives. We can look at these emblems. They remind us of God's kept promise and sending Jesus. Because they remind us of the one that God provided to keep those promises. These emblems remind us of his death and how he became that sacrificial offering to make atonement for our sins. But as we partake of these emblems, they remind us the, of the personal nature of our acceptance with God. The, we become members of that family of God only through faith in Christ. It's an individual thing. It's a personal thing. And as we partake of these emblems, it reminds us of that as well too. Like the Israelites, there's a sense around this table that we look back as well, that we give thanks for God's goodness, for God's grace, for God's kept promises. But as we come around this table, there is that sense we look forward as well too, because we are looking forward even to that Savior's coming. Till he comes. 
God kept his promises. God keeps his promises even today. And so he'll keep this promise again in Christ Jesus. Before our brothers pray for the emblems, let me read this familiar passage once more in 1 Corinthians. The Lord Jesus, when he's betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're now going to give thanks for the the emblems and then distribute them. Let's, Let's give thanks. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to gather around your table, Lord, and for the emblems and to thank you, Lord, for your love to us. Thank you for sending Jesus into this world, Lord, and for his perfect life, who committed no sin and did no sin and did nothing but goodness, but yet, Lord, in the fullness of time, he went to the cross and bore our sin on the cross, Lord. He died for my sin and died for the sin of the world and for whosoever will may come. And, Lord, we thank you that for your life and for your death and for your resurrection. We thank you that, Lord, you uh, defeated sin and death and rose victorious into heaven, into God's right hand, where you are dwelling for us now, Lord, interceding on our behalf. Lord, we live in an uncertain world, and every day we get up, Lord, there's something different happens. But we thank thank you for your promises. Thank you that for those in Christ that you have surely said that one day we will be in heaven and we will worship you forever. And Lord, it's all because of the cross, all because of what you did for us. So Lord, may your spirit guide us further and speak into our hearts and our souls as we partake of the bread, reminding us of your body given on that cruel cross that we might live and that our sins would be accomplished by you in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, again, we come into your presence this morning and we thank you that we can come around this table at your invitation because of what you have accomplished at the place called Calvary. As we take this cup now, which is a tangible reminder of the precious blood that was shed so freely, shed for rebels, shed for sinners, 
Just got a shed for me. And we stand this morning redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And he says, if you take this cup now, Lord, help us to take it with a thankful heart and give you praise and honor for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, that you are a faithful God, that you keep your promises, that you kept your promise in sending a Redeemer, that he came in the way that you had foretold, that he lived that life even that you had foretold, that he died that atoning death even as you foretold as well. But Father, he he rose again and will come again. Your word tells us and assures us of that coming. And so, Father, as we partake of these emblems, how these are a a continual reminder to us even each week of how you kept your promise in Christ. We give you thanks for that. And, Father, we look forward and we help us to, to live hopefully, expectantly, continuing to serve you, Lord, as as we do look forward even to that day when he will come again. And so, Father, just cause us even today just to to pause, to stop and reflect, even in your goodness in our own lives, just for those everyday mercies, Lord, even that we have for our families, for our friends, for our church family, Lord, for our salvation cause us to be thankful. May others see the joy that is within us. Father, bless us and help us in Jesus' name. Amen.